In general, my prediction would be that 2024 is the year where performance, you know, we end the year basically and performance stops being a differentiator. Everybody will have figured mm -hmm. out high performance. Finally, now that we've learned how to modify nodes, everybody will like figure out in some way, you know, not everybody will, will be in production, few will be in production, the best teams only. But over the years, what's happening is that the best technology that was considered a moat is finally starting to be, for lack of a better word, democratized and accessed by everyone. Welcome to Bankless, where we explore the frontier of Ethereum's Layer 2 rollups. Today on the show, we have Georgios Constantinopoulos, the CTO and researcher over at Paradigm, and Andrew Huang, CEO of Conduit. Both of these extremely smart gentlemen have unique vantage points over the future of, of Ethereum's rollups that needs to be shared with the world. Here is what you're going to hear on this episode today. What is the state of Ethereum's rollups in 2024? What's going right and what is still left to do? How will rollups recompose with each other? What mechanisms are there to help with rollup composability? And do rollups even need to compose with each other at all? Or is that narrative just totally overblown? What about rollup security, multi-client fraud proofs and multi-ZK provers, why Giorgios thinks we get them this year, and why Andrew thinks we're entering a golden age of layer two deployments, and why Giorgios thinks we're entering a golden age of layer two experimentation. I learned so much in this episode. As soon as I'm done recording this intro, I'm going to go back and listen to it. Before we get into this episode, though, we disclose Ryan and I hold investments in some of the layer twos mentioned today. We also hold ETH. You can see all Bankless disclosures at bankless.com slash disclosures. Now let's go ahead and get right into the episode with Georgios and Andrew. But first, a moment to talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible, especially Kraken, our preferred crypto exchange for entering or exiting layer twos in Ethereum. That's Kraken. If you do not have an account with Kraken, consider clicking the link in the show notes below to getting started with Kraken today. Kraken knows crypto. Kraken's been in the crypto game for over a decade, and as one of the largest and most trusted exchanges in the industry, Kraken is on the journey with all of us to see what crypto can be. Human history is a story of progress. It's part of us, hardwired. We're designed to seek change everywhere, to improve, to strive. And if anything can be improved, why not finance? Crypto is a financial system designed with the modern world in mind. Instant permissionless and 24 seven. It's not perfect and nothing ever will be perfect, but crypto is a world changing technology at a time when the world needs it the most. That's the Kraken mission to accelerate the global adoption of cryptocurrency so that you and the rest of the world can achieve financial freedom and inclusion. Head on over to kraken.com slash bankless to see what crypto can be. Not investment advice, crypto trading involves risk of loss. Cryptocurrency services are provided to US and US territory customers by Payward Ventures Inc. PVI doing business as Kraken. Mantle, formerly known as BitDAO, is the first DAO-led Web3 ecosystem all built on top of Mantle's first core product, the Mantle Network, a brand new high-performance Ethereum Layer 2 built using the OP stack, but uses Eigenlayer's data availability solution instead of the expensive Ethereum Layer 1. Not only does this reduce Mantle Network's gas fees by 80%, but it also reduces gas fee volatility, providing a more stable foundation for Mantle's applications. The Mantle Treasury is one of the biggest DAO-owned treasuries, which is seeding an ecosystem of projects from all around the Web3 space for Mantle. Mantle already has sub-communities from around Web3 Web3 onboarded, like Game7 for Web3 Gaming, and Bybit for TVL and Liquidity and OnRamps. So if you want to build on the Mantle network, Mantle is offering a grants program that provides milestone-based funding to promising projects that help expand, secure, and decentralize Mantle. If you want to get started working with the first DAO-led Layer 2 ecosystem, check out Mantle at mantle.xyz and follow them on Twitter at 0xMantle. Are you launching a token? Is it already live? How are you managing the legal and tax for providing token awards for your team? Toku simplifies everything about managing token grant compensation, and you can get started with them for free. You'll have access to top-notch legal and tax support to handle the distribution and management of tokens for your team. Toku caters to every step in the process, from user-friendly legal templates for granting tokens to tracking vesting periods and calculating withholding taxes. Toku understands every grant structure, token purchase agreements, restricted token awards, restricted token units, token options, and all the other ones. Toku is already simplifying this today for leading companies like Protocol Labs, DYDX Foundation, Mina Foundation, and many more. You can learn more about how Toku can help you streamline your token management and get started for free. Visit Toku at toku.com slash bankless or click the link in the description below. Bankless Nation, I am excited to introduce you to Georgios Constantinopoulos, the CTO of Paradigm. 
Georgios is an enjoyer of Rust and has helped build RETH and OP Wreath, a Rust-based execution engine for Ethereum and the OP stack. He's been on Bankless before, talking about MEV, when we first discovered its implications all the way back in 2021. Georgios, welcome back to Bankless. Hi, David, and thank you for having us. Andrew Huang is the CEO and founder of Conduit, which is a roll-up as a service provider. Many of the Layer 2s, which you have likely used, were spun up and supported by Conduit, including Zora, Avo, Public Goods Network, and many others. RASs, as they're called, are, as infrastructure supporting rollups, both present and future, have a unique vantage point for seeing the evolution of Layer 2s, which is why we're bringing Andrew on the show here today. Andrew, welcome to Bankless. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Excited to chat today. I think the whole entire Ethereum ecosystem, the crypto ecosystem, would really just like a, an audit of the state of Layer 2s, the state of rollups. There's many, many rollups going in many different directions with different design strategies, different holes. Uh, and there's still a lot of like unknowns for what the future holds, I think, for the scaling of Ethereum. While rollups did give us a lot of clarity for how Ethereum will scale, it has also given us a lot of questions, mainly in the world of fragmentation and, and security. So George, yes, maybe we could just start with that. Can you just kind of give us the vibe of the audit of layer twos. How are we doing? What's going right? What do we still need to work on? Just overall, give us your sentiment check. Uh, yes, of course. So starting from the basics, A, it exists and it's real, which I think <laughs> is on its own a remarkable achievement after many years of hard research and hard work. And uh, I have pulled up here uh, L2Beat, which is a great website that many people reference these days. And you can notice that the current TVL in Layer 2s amounts to almost 20 bill, a number that has over 10x almost this year. Um, uh, the risk is in a lot better spot. We're suddenly starting to have rollups deploy more fault proofs in 2024. We're seeing the Security Councils going live. We're gradually moving towards a so-called stage two decentralization in rollups. Um, if you keep looking at L2Bit, you will notice that there is over 20 or 30 maybe rollups live of various types, optimistic, ZK. Some are not even rollups. Granted, some might have the layer two or the off-chain data availability. But overall, things are growing. Technology that is advancing. Things are being deployed which I personally find uh, really exciting. That is on the core tech side. Now, there's a whole ecosystem being developed around roll-up services. There's companies like Espresso that are building shared sequencers for people that want to outsource their sequencing needs. There's companies like Conduit, which we'll talk about in a second, that are building the infra for people to deploy more and more rollups. There's other companies building alternative data availability layers. And you know, there's the evolving rollup stack and the layer two stack that we envisioned many years ago that is finally starting to play out in production. Now, are we done? No, we're not. We still have a lot more to do. The ecosystem still depends on permissioned uh, fault proofs. It still depends on permissioned sequencers, on, in general, the stacks are nascent. We still have a lot to do, but that is for the coming years. But overall, super excited, and I think today is a great day to be having this episode because we're almost at a pivotal point in the scaling story for Ethereum and its ecosystem. What are the big problems that you identify, Georgios, as things that we still need to work on in the Layer 2 space? Obviously, security uh, is one that you mentioned and brought up and will be an ongoing thing that we will need to work on for a, a while. There's been a recent focus on while Layer 2s are scaling, they are also fragmenting, uh, which is one of the big problems. What would you say are the big obstacles, the big research obstacles or maybe engineering obstacles that the Ethereum Layer 2 space needs to focus on more? Of course. Um, I think we're actually way past the research phase. Um, this year has shown that we're entering this deep productionization phase where all the research is mostly done. And right now we're just seeing productionized deployments of things that we've known for a while. Um, so right now the things that I think are very important are, as you said, security. So right now um, you can check the state of the security of the ecosystem just by counting the multisigs uh, that that govern all the rollups. As long as we have all of these multisigs, it's going to be hard uh, for us to consider the ecosystem like really mature and secure. Now, what are we doing for that? Uh, we're moving towards multiple fault-proof implementations for each rollup. We're moving towards delays uh, on any kind of power that any security council must have. 
we're limiting the power of every security council to, let's say, only when there is a layer one hard fork. Um, we have a lot of work to do on decentralization. Right now, most, if not all, rollups are sequenced by one sequencer, usually the one by the labs entity that or the foundation entity that the company runs, um, the project that built them, um, which is okay given that there is the layer one fallback option. However, it also means that the system can go down as we saw many times this year with various projects. So overall, we also have work to do there. So one, security, two, decentralization. Now three, there is one not as spoken about topic, that is the tooling, which is all that we think about at Paradigm. And for tooling, the problem is gonna start manifesting when people switch to different opcodes, when people switch to different precompiles. There's a lot, a lot of areas where things can start to change. And right now, people are not um, ready for, the tooling is not ready to support this evolution in the layer two ecosystem. For example, if somebody builds a new opcode for their layer two because they want to experiment, now they need to go into the Solidity compiler and edit the compiler and figure out a way to expose that to the user. And people just don't have the expertise to do that and somebody, some mistakes will happen if we don't prepare for that. So we really, really, really need to make the tooling like ready and robust and modular and extensible so that it's ready for this Cambrian explosion of layer two innovation over 2024 as the barrier to entry goes down and as the stacks mature. And that's part of like the tooling that we're also trying to build uh, with our teams uh, in an effort to make them extensible and ready for layer two. Andrew, I want to turn to you and get kind of a similar perspective from you and, and what you see over at, at Conduit. But before we dive into the same, more, more or less the same set of questions uh, with your perspective, maybe you could also illuminate what your perspective is. What does the perspective at Conduit give you? Uh, you are a roll-up as a service provider. You talk to a lot of Layer 2 teams uh, doing different things, similar things. And so maybe first uh, illuminate for us the vantage point that you have as your role at Conduit, and then we'll kind of go into the same set of questions that I just asked Georgios. Yeah, definitely. So um, as you said, we work closely with a lot of the Layer 2 teams. We work with folks that want to launch chains. Um, we work with integrations that need to integrate on those chains. And so I think it's a very kind of like pivotal point in the ecosystem that affords us the opportunity to really like see a lot of different things. Um, and importantly, see what's kind of on the bleeding edge here and, and how we can help enable that. Um, I think the TLDR here for us is like, um, if a year ago, I think nobody was really thinking about many different rollups. And um, I think uh, it was viewed as much riskier. I think today it's in some ways kind of like becoming the default. Um, and we're very excited to kind of help with that transition. Um, and I think for a variety of reasons, both economic as well as um, frankly, just at a technical level, enabling kind of new applications to be built. Um, we're really seeing kind of the rise of the modular blockchain. And I think um, in some ways it's kind of the Cosmos thesis, but playing out on Ethereum um, where people do want sovereign chains, but you kind of have those interoperability standards that um, allow folks to kind of transact across chains and across rollups in a way that kind of makes sense. Um, and so very excited to kind of be at the center of that and, and um, kind of playing, playing a role in, um, you know, all the complexity Georgios was kind of mentioning around fault proofs and removing multi-sigs and upgrades and um, it's just one difficult for the labs found or foundations or whoever's running them to do themselves like it takes a lot of time and not to mention if a random kind of dev team wants their own kind of roll up um, you know in some ways be impossible and you see folks kind of mess it up all the time and their bridge gets hacked or something happens and I think one of the benefits of like a RAS provider like Conduit is you, know, you get all of that same great tech and all of those migrations and like upgrades kind of seamlessly and kind of like AWS, instead of focusing on building the best data center and like all of this kind of undifferentiated heavy lifting, um, you get to focus on kind of the important thing, which is like building a great application for your users. And so we're very excited to help facilitate that transition. Mm -hmm. And so what are the strengths of the layer two ecosystem right now? What's going well for teams as a whole that, that you work with? And then also, what are the, some of the pain points? What are the hurdles? What are the difficulties that, that teams are experiencing? Yeah, so I think the, um, so one, I think the first question when it comes to your own rollup is like, how do you actually stand this up in production in a kind of secure, reliable, performant way? Uh, and I think 
a lot of roll-up frameworks make it easy to spin up a test net, uh, even like a local version, but there's like a huge gap between that and like something that is ready to custody and kind of hold user funds. Um, and that's really where Conduit comes into play, again, making that seamless. So you get that at the click of a button, all of the work we put into reliability, security, performance, um, et cetera, um, you just get for free. And it again, it makes sense for us to invest in because we run like hundreds of these across mainnet and testnet. Um, and so like those kind of small percentage points that might not matter for you um, really matter for us. And that means you're getting the, the best offering. I think typically after that, the next thing we see is, is frankly just like, um, for lack of a better word, PMF, I think like, I think like early on in the narrative, it was, you know, we just launch a chain and it's going to work and it's a new thing and therefore we'll have users. I think very quickly it's become clear that, um, you know, Rollup will need to differentiate in what they offer. Um, and I find that exciting because I think we'll start to see, um, instead of like clones of your favorite DeFi app or like, you know, the, the 10th or 11th clone of like Uniswap, we'll actually get something new and differentiated. And I think like mm. one example that I've been, you know, kind of was a dark horse for me, but like it's been really exciting to see play out is something like Zora Network where, you know, they're very focused on kind of the collecting side of things. And that network has grown in a really interesting way where suddenly they have all of this data around like mints and art that, um, you know, only exists on the Zora Network. And I think they'll be able to create really compelling applications and new behaviors on top of that. So you're saying that you think that there will be a trend away from the highly general layer twos and layer twos as a as an ecosystem, as a category are all going to shift the Overton window towards more specialist, specialized niche uh, layer twos that are optimized for more narrow use cases. Is that is that what you you think is going to happen? I'd say we see a bit of both. I think it ultimately depends on the brand. I think something like Base, for example, right? Huge brand, mm. a lot of access to, you know, retail users. That just makes sense as like kind of a generic chain that has everything. Um, but I think for kind of your average dev team that, uh, you know, like a startup, right? They need to build something new and differentiated um, and aren't going to have the same distribution or, or brand benefits that some of these larger organizations have. And I think the only way to differentiate yourself is really on the go-to-market and what kind of uniquely is happening on your chain in terms of the state space. Um, and that's kind of my recommendation to teams is, you know, actually building something novel versus um, just trying to be kind of your hundredth DGN uh, DeFi chain. So I want to ask the very big question that I think a lot of people are asking in the layer two space, which is few rollups or many rollups. And there are arguments for both sides here. The, the few rollups arguments are the fewer rollups you have, the more net composability there, there are. So, you know, there's fewer different uh, chains to be fragmented around. So like, you know, the more liquidity aggregation, fewer, you know, fewer networks in the drop down on MetaMask. And so uh, more composability is just good UX. And also rollups individually have costs. And so if we aggregate everything together, you can consolidate the costs in order to save money. And so these are some of the arguments for why there will be a few uh, rollups. But then there's also arguments on the other side, which are that technology costs always get cheaper. And that's something that Conduit is doing. It's making it cheaper for layer twos to exist. And that will only uh, uh, improve over time. There's also a rollups desire for sovereignty that we know that this is a powerful force. Games, for example, will probably want their own chains. So what do you guys think? Well, which is it? Is it few rollups? Is it many rollups? Giorgio, so I'll start with you and Andrew, you'll, you'll follow on. Yeah, of course. So there's two axes on the demand side. One mm. is cost and the other is customizability or being free. You called it sovereignty earlier, mm. being able to do whatever you want. On cost, how to think about it from or how I would think about it is that rollups is a, an elastic scaling solution. You add more compute, the more load arrives. So if we end up having so much compute demand, then probably there will be many rollups because it is unlikely to expect, like we saw from all the past L1 lessons, that one chain will be able to accommodate the world's compute. Or that's where I come from, at least. Uh, others, some might disagree, and that's perfectly fine. Um, now, on the side of customizability, of course, that comes off at uh, odds sometimes with the perfect horizontal scaling thesis, which means that, you know, sometimes when the demand might be enough for five chains, 
maybe there's 10 chains because people want some extra customization that you cannot get in the other place. For example, a big brand like Coinbase or, I don't know, say Starbucks or someone. <laughs> um, for some reason, maybe they would want to be on a separate area. Why? Maybe there's like a lot of customizations that they want to make, or maybe they want to own the brand, or they want to do specialized airdrops and whatnot. Hard to tell. Um, so I think it is hard to bet on few, as in, you know, one or five or ten. Um, so, and I would probably expect a power load distribution to nobody's surprise on where the demand gets uh, kind of like concentrated, let's say in the top whatever. But I expect a very, very long tail of chains with also varying duration. Because imagine a game could be played over a day on a, you know, people have called these flash chains, one day roll up, pop up roll ups, whatever you want to call them. Um, you know, maybe you play a game for a day, um, an on chain game. That game maybe has like stupidly high state growth or whatever, so it would never make sense to actually put it on a real network. And then you just checkpoint the result into a layer two or a layer one or something else. So the whole coprocessor thesis that many people have been putting out, uh, it might also apply in the rollups, and that would enable thousands and thousands and thousands of rollups, but also with a very small duration. Power law, a lot of activity, but the duration of each chain might change. Demand for customizability also might affect that. Mm -hmm. The reason why I like having both Georgios and Andrew here is we have Georgios, the researcher, and Andrew, the market founder. Uh, and so one of the uh, perspectives I enjoy here is that Conduit is uh, tapped into what the demands of the market are. What can you tell us, Andrew, about the few roll-ups versus many roll-ups conversation and in terms of what the market wants with your clients and needs uh, over at Conduit? For sure. Well, I guess one point zooming zooming out and kind of tying it back to what Giorgio said earlier, I think like if you believe there's only going to be a limited amount of demand for crypto compute, then I guess like the kind of few roll up um, kind of world makes sense. If you're really bullish on crypto and, you know, new applications taking off more and more demand, I think like by necessity, you're just going to need many, many of these different kind of crypto compute environments. So just as an argument for like industry growth as a whole, I think it's almost somewhat bearish to believe that there's only going to be a couple of rollups um, to serve all that demand, um, and so you know here at Conduit we're we're bi uh, we're very bullish on crypto and kind of believe in this globe centric <laughs> world with kind of thousands or hundreds of thousands of these rollups, um, and so just kind of from from that argument alone, I think we're we're very excited about it. In terms of like what we're seeing from a market level, I think ultimately uh, one customization is a good point, but I think even more than that, I think there are large economic reasons to launch your own rollup and. You know, I think the biggest factor that we see today um, is that when you launch and deploy on another chain, you're essentially paying rent to that chain. Um, and by deploying your own chain, you get to like internalize those fees. Um, and not to mention you have more control over your, your own ecosystem. It's narratively kind of a great thing to do. Um, you get to customize, you get to maybe build your own ecosystem on top of that, right? So you have your own L2 with many different L3s on top, other types of applications. And so I think just from a pure economic argument and kind of like a pure sovereignty argument, there's just this incredible kind of demand to launch your own block space in the same way that if you look at Web2 today, right, it's not one big global computer or like a couple big global databases. Like every company has like their own application. Um, and like if you look at Facebook, right, like they have a ton of apps and whatever they built on top. It's this like gigantic system. Like that could be one big roll up or it might be like multiple roll ups. Um, but then you have this long tail of other companies that also have their own, you know, roll ups. Um, and I think like if I'm thinking through like what the future kind of holds for crypto, it's um, that model seems a little more clear to me where I think like it's unclear that every application needs maximum composability at all times and therefore needs to pay all this rent and like all these other things to a single chain. Um, it seems clear to me that kind of like asynchronous message passing or like if you look at, you know, APIs today, right, it's like kind of this asynchronous kind of webhook kind of thing or like you just have an integrations API that happens less frequently than kind of normal. Um, but then you co-locate the logic that's really kind of important. Um, and, you know, I think the scaling argument, this kind of like demand for customization, this um, demand for like economics um, is really driving what we're seeing in terms of this Cambrian explosion of chains.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, it, if we're going to see thousands and thousands and millions of chains, we need infrastructure that we can like copy and paste, right? We need highly replicatable uh, infrastructure in order to make that happen. Uh, and this is where a lot of the uh, battles are being fought in the layer two space from all of like the super chain standards, the the optimism super chains, Arbitrum orbits, Polygon super nets, ZK sync hyper chains. Uh, the way I think about these things is that they're all economic zones because the block space is very alike inside of a network, right? And so like the OP stack mainnet is very alike to the base mainnet, right? And so these have a relationship with each other that's more close than, for example, like base is to Arbitrum. And so these are, this is how I think about these things, economic zones. Uh, and they can engage in trade with other economic zones, right? Like Arbitrum can trade with Optimism via a bridge, like across. Uh, but trade is going to be easier inside of the Optimism super chain. Trade will be easier inside of an Arbitrum orbit, and then it'll be a little bit more costly to go between these things. This is my perspective for how I understand and it, Georgios, how do you think about the whole evolution of, of super chains? Yes, uh, maybe to give you a bit of a cynical take to start, um, anything mm. that we say in this conversation will probably be more speculative and more an expectation of what is to happen, given that there's none of these systems live yet in sure. production. Um, there exists one system called Astria that was deployed a few weeks ago, but it's still in testnet, and it even had some issues at the deployment. Um, when they deployed their shared sequencer. So it might be worth zooming out and thinking what problem are we trying to solve um, as a first place. Mm. Um, and the problem you mentioned earlier, David, it's how do we make these different cities talk to each other in a cheap way without introducing too much additional layer of trust. Uh, when is this useful? Um, one would think first and foremost on DeFi, you know, or on transfers. I am on chain A, you're on chain B, and we want to talk to each other without having to think even um, about uh, where am I sending money to, right? Um, and as you said earlier, we don't want to be in a world where I go to MetaMask and I pick from a dropdown of 55 or 100 or whatever RPCs. That's terrible user experience, and honestly, we would have failed miserably if uh, we're in that world. So the super chains or the shared sequencers or whatever you want to call them, they come in as a set of solutions that try to address that by allowing you to interact with one uh, endpoint as a user, one place. Um, and the sequencer smartly will route to the right area, whatever transaction needs to happen. Um, and all of these super chains roughly have that same vision, that they want to abstract away the communication inside of their own ecosystems. Now, there's solutions that achieve that for heterogeneous systems like uh, Espresso, um, and they introduce, they require modifications to each of these stacks to make them compatible with each other. For example, to make the Arbitrum Orbit stack shared sequenceable with the Optimism Superchain stack, um, Espresso needs to modify with the same modifications both systems to make them compatible. And mm. to what extent that will be feasible or not uh, is TBD and is an exciting area overall. One uh, point that is worth uh, unpacking, though, is that none, to, our, to the best of our knowledge, none of the systems offer, um, let's say, the holy grail of synchronous calls across all of these systems. Um, there's no world where, you know, you can say A calls B, which calls back to A and, and does a lot of like things together. Um, unless you're in the design where you're, you're basically one chain. Um, and that is where the optimism super chain design is going toward. Um, for the most part, what you get from all of these shared sequencing designs, you get atomic top of block um, in inclusion, which is useful for MEV, um, which we had talked about uh, two years ago, David. So the idea there is that the shared sequencer is able to guarantee that five transactions will always be at the top of the block. And these five transactions that will be on top of block A and not on top of block B will be extracting some kind of arbitrage uh, opportunity that existed. And that makes money, and that's a valuable service to be offering, and that could be a valuable like infrastructure protocol to be running. However, to go far beyond that, you know, in terms of conditional execution, let's say I send the transaction on A, and that means that the transaction also delivers on B and stuff like that, I don't think we have any design yet that is soundly 
implementing that. Um, and finally, a general so that's, area... So that part is still in the research phase? I, I would think that it's um, <laughs> the, the way that people are trying to do it without doing further modifications to their systems, I think is not there yet. Um, mm. The most promising design that I have seen is one in a blog post by James Prestwich, uh, which describes a certain way where each block commits on every other block in the super chain. Again, research phase. Um, so I, I take back what I said earlier that we're done with the research right. phase. There's that, uh, there that component that is not figured out. But it's also worth understanding that it might not be worth figuring out fully. You know, maybe the holy grail um, solution of feature set, nobody needs. And maybe you can get away with something you can ship in like in a year or in six months um, that solves the real problem, which is not actually the composability, but the decentralization. The problem is that every one of these systems is run by one person. Uh, whereas ideally, there's not that much of a problem. As you said earlier, we have a cross, we have, you know, 10 bridge protocols to do all the transfers. People will figure, let the market figure that out. But the part about the decentralization is more critical, especially as, you know, more and more infrastructure gets launched and we put our kind of like trust on few intermediaries. Mm -hmm. George, could you go into shared sequencing a little bit more? Uh, just what composability benefits does shared sequencing give chains? And does that conversation change if we are talking about uh, all these chains inside of a single like um, uh, setup, like uh, all the OP stack chains that are going to be a part of the super chain? These can shared sequence with each other in some degrees and produce some composability benefits. And then there's also the potential, like you said, of optimism and arbitrum uh, shared sequencing and also getting those kind of composability benefits. Overall, what does shared sequencing get us? Right. So it it solves you composability and some, to some degree decentralization. Composability, though, it solves to a small degree as described today and TBD, whether it can solve it to a larger degree. And uh, surely shared sequencing in the same ecosystem, in the same flavor is going to be cheaper, easier, more compatible. Where it's trying to make two different ecosystems talk to each other will be harder and might not even be, you know, desired to some extent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's always what I've uh, thought is going to be difficult because sequencing is the golden goose for layer twos. Like that is where they get a lot of their fees. So why would Arbitrum and Optimism want to give up their sequencing fees to Espresso in the name of um, a decent but marginal amount of uh, uh, um, composability benefits? Right, I think uh, jury is still out there, and I think depending on who you ask, you will get a different uh, response. Um, from my point of view, um, the Optimism ecosystem, for example, wants to build a moat around a, a different set of, let's say, infrastructure components or values, for example, the governance and the entire process around the law of chains. Whereas mm -hmm. the, it's kind of almost acknowledging that a, the biggest part of the technology is open source, is to be given away. It is not really a moat. Uh, or if it is a moat, it's a very weak one that's going to go away over time. Um, whereas the real moat is elsewhere. So that would be one take. Uh, and also remember that to opt into the super chain ecosystem, and Andrew will tell you that very well, um, you pay a rent uh, mm -hmm. back to the back to the super chain, the optimism collective. And uh, that is where uh, it comes in. Effectively, Optimism is offering a service that is the shared upgrades, the shared governance, and the shared sequencing, which is going to be in part um, mandated by Optimism smart contracts. And it's happy to take a cut for it. And all the rest, mm -hmm. let the ecosystem figure out because it's hard to pick a solution yourself. Maybe you don't even want to build it yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, Andrew can cover more on how this looks like from the you know, business perspective of how do rollups actually, uh, you know, because we've done this with multiple customers so far. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely want to get there because I think that that conversation of uh, chain uh, synchrony and chain composability and chain governance, I think is one of the most interesting ones. And I know that Andrew at Conduit, you're like right at the heart of that thing, uh, the heart of that conversation. But George, just one last conversation before we I ask that, that question to Andrew. Is universal composability a dream? Like every single layer two across Ethereum, different constructions, different setups, even if it's like 10 years in the future. Is that a pipe dream or how far can we get there? Uh, I, I think it is hard to beat against the mad Ethereum scientists, just to <laughs> say it as a, 
as a prerequisite. So, um, you know, David, it's hard to bet on a 10 year time horizon. My view sure. is that we don't have any fundamental, let's say, problems to be solved, but there's also a degree of like a prioritization. And I think that we also need to think about the demand side. When the demand side requires that we solve universal composability, trust me, we will find a way to solve it. Mm -hmm. But I think sometimes to, we should acknowledge that in the Ethereum ecosystem, we don't always take the most, uh, let's say, boots on the ground demand side. And we always think, oh, what's the most perfect protocol I can design for the next 10 years? So I think uh, trying to answer that question, we could entertain it, but I think it's more worth focusing on the important topics on the see. ground. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Because we're in this very pivotal phase in crypto and we really need to stay focused, stay close to the customer and on the user experience. We solve fees, then we solve wallets. We solve wallets, we solve products, and then, you know, right. off to the races. And yeah, the horizon always always uh, continues. Andrew, I want to talk about the, the spawning of these super chains and orbits and hyper chains and sub, uh, super nets because in my, from my perspective, Conduit is the place where these things spawn from since Conduit is the place where it's the cheapest to make more chains. So I always kind of see the super chain spawning out of Conduit and there are competitors in which the super chain also can spawn from, but a lot of uh, OP stack chains come out of conduit. So what is your perspective on the evolution of these systems? What uh, do alike layer twos, what benefits do they have? Uh, what benefits do they have of being both optimized and built by conduit? But like call it a neighbor change, right? Um, just overall, what's your perspective on the, the growth of these ecosystems? Yeah, I think the growth is really exciting. I think like, um, you know, I think narratively there's kind of, and kind of optimism probably uh, fired the first shot here around like the super chain um, and like kind of homogenous block space, kind of tighter and dropper ability. Um, and I think other ecosystems have kind of quickly followed in, in kind of their their ways and credit to them. I think the uh, maybe like zooming out, I guess the question would be like, how much does that interoperability actually matter to users? And like based off of the current applications that we're seeing, um, it's not clear to me that there's a huge benefit outside of the current bridging protocols that already exist. Um, and so just to rattle off a couple of customers, somebody like Avo, right? It's kind of this decentralized exchange and like, you know, not a lot of interoperability opportunities outside of bridging from other rollups. You can take a look at public goods network, right? Um, and kind of running some Gitcoin grants rounds, but again, not a ton of opportunity for interop beyond bridging to the chain. Zora network, again, you can make the same case. And I think that will just frankly um, be kind of how these new rollups actually launch is they need to do something differentiated and new. And by definition, that isn't going to actually need that level of interoperation that, um, hmm. you know, we desperately think everybody needs. And I think in some sense, there is this, um, I'm not going to call it vestigial, but I think like we're so early in terms of how one, like crypto compute has developed to how applications have developed that it's so hard to make the case that this is the end state of maximum global composability. And that's the most important thing. And maybe drawing an allusion to like Web2, you know, back before we had like networked computers, you know, Unix pipes were probably like, Unix pipes were like kind of the equivalent of composability and like people use them all the time. And then uh, now you just use it for like a bash script on your like local computer, right? And then like everything happens in the cloud, everything happens over the network. Um, and so it's just kind of this new dominant model that became possible because the compute landscape really changed and the capabilities of that allowed for new things. And so I think there's somewhat of this vestigial overhang of maximum composability that um, even if you look at the numbers today, um, aren't necessarily like the largest use cases, particularly in like hmm. emerging rollups. Interesting. Uh, George previously p gave us an axis uh, about a roll-up uh, designs and constructions. There was like the customizability and then the cost. Uh, I want to present another spectrum, uh, Andrew, uh, along like this whole like super chain conversation. And there is on one side of the spectrum, every single chain is a part of a super chain, whether it's the optimism super chain or an arbitrum orbit or as a polygon uh, super net, or every single chain is it's a complete independent chain and it's not part of these collectives. Uh, the reason why I always kind of thought 
thought this super chain conversation is cool is because these are digital collectives of block space. Uh, and there's like the optimism collective, which manages the super chain. And where we end up on this spectrum where every single chain is its own independent ecosystem versus every single chain has determined that it's beneficial to be a part of a collective, only the future can, re can really tell us. Uh, the bull case for optimism, the optimism collective, is that the value of being a part of the collective, the uh, value of being part of those shared upgrades in that homogenous block space is worth it so that they, the fees that the collective charges, like the union fees, call it, uh, is worth it. That, that's, a, that's a worth worthwhile trade-off. Or maybe it's not, and people are more inclined to stay an independent layer two inside of their own ecosystem and sacrifice some of those composability benefits. Do you have a perspective as to where we end up on this slide? scale of uh, unionized layer twos or independent layer twos. Yeah, I mean, like maybe like a reframing of super chain is kind of taking out the interoperability aspect is like, how much is it worth it to have homogenous block space, right? That, mm. you know, you can interact with in the same way, it has all of the same security guarantees. Um, and it seems like, you know, in a world of many, many rollups, like that matters a lot. There's, you know, a reason why in web two, you talk about like API compatibility, right? And like different clouds, right? They copy each other's APIs so that you can just migrate in or like, you know, you make a new database product and it's like Postgres compatible. And so there is a good reason as to, you know, why to do it in a compatible way and to kind of have these shared upgrades that maybe isn't necessarily so tied to the interoperability aspect, even though that might be a nice kind of future add on. Um, I don't know that that has to be um, only part of the super chain. For example, like you can follow the same upgrades and do that without being a part of the super chain or even on the Arbitrum Orbit side, right? You could stay closely to the spec, stay closely to what the governance kind of approved versions are and kind of upgrade in concert with that. Um, I think ultimately it's an area that like infra providers like Conduit will play and a service that we offer, right? Is that you can get the gold stamp that your chain is gonna be compatible and like equivalent to all of these other major networks that are very popular and everybody use. Um, and so I think to answer your question, I think compatibility is a, is a key kind of thing, particularly in this early phase, as we're getting this explosion of chains, as we're kind of getting these like integration headaches where it's like, oh, like a new chain spun, uh, spins up every day. How am I going to like integrate? And like just knowing that your stuff is going to work properly um, is a huge benefit. And that also ultimately ties into the types of customizations that we're interested in at Conduit, where, you know, one thing we, um, we can't talk about it publicly yet, but we're, we have some exciting kind of custom chains in the works. Um, and ultimately one of the services that we provide is like, listen, like we're happy to do customizations, but we also want to make sure that one, your forge compatible with like future upgrades and two, that you're not doing it in a way that makes you so unique that people can't use you. Um, and mm -hmm. so we're very excited about both kind of the max compatibility as well as this broad spectrum of customization that ultimately will enable like new types of applications. Okay, so compatibility, I really want to double click on that. So you're, you're saying that there's there's some benefits of having homogenous block space and, and true composability in the blockchain transaction uh, sense of that of that of the focus that so much of crypto Twitter has been on lately. But I think what you're saying is that there's also just ecosystem benefits. There's infrastructure benefits, there's shared standard benefits, maybe developer, um, uh, and I'm outside of my uh, outside of my wheelhouse here because this is all t very technical, but just there's like, you know, the benefits of the EVM, for example, or like, well, the Optimism ecosystem has uh, Rust, the the Rust uh, OP stack client that I think Georgios and many others uh, at Paradigm are, are are using. And so, if you want to be a part of that uh, shared uh, ecosystem, the, you you have benefits of being inside of the OP stack or part of the super chain. Is that is that part of your answer? I think that like similar to how you know browser and the JavaScript have taken over kind of web development, and everything is based around this kind of core kind of open source software stuff. Um, there's a very good reason to stay EVM compatible and like work with, you know, the optimism super chain, really anything mm -hmm. that's like compatible and has a big kind of open source community around it to benefit from all of those network effects. And like, you can see firsthand with what Georges is doing with breath and like op breath and like all these other things that, you know, you just work with the EVM, you work with like optimism or whatever role framework, and you just get these massive performance improvements for free. Um, and like. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I think as a dev and as somebody who's going to launch their chain, 
you want to be able to ride that wave up versus fighting against the tide. Arbitrum is the leading Ethereum scaling solution that is home to hundreds of decentralized applications. Arbitrum's technology allows you to interact with Ethereum at scale with low fees and faster transactions. Arbitrum has the leading DeFi ecosystem, strong infrastructure options, flourishing NFTs, and is quickly becoming the Web3 gaming hub. Explore the ecosystem at portal.arbitrum.io. Are you looking to permissionlessly launch your own Arbitrum Orbit chain? Arbitrum Orbit allows anyone to utilize Arbitrum's secure scaling technology to build your own Orbit chain, giving you access to interoperable, customizable permissions with dedicated throughput. Whether you are a developer, an enterprise, or a user, Arbitrum Orbit lets you take your project to new heights. All of these technologies leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum. Experience Web3 development the way it was always meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free. Visit Arbitrum.io and get your journey started in one of the largest Ethereum communities. Celo is the mobile-first, EVM-compatible, carbon-negative blockchain built for the real world. And now, something big is happening. Introducing the Celo Layer 2. It's a game-changing proposal that's going to bring Celo's rapidly growing ecosystem home to Ethereum. Vitalik has shared his excitement for the Celo Layer 2 on the Celo Forum, so has Ben Jones from Optimism. But why? The Celo Layer 2 will bring huge advantages, like a decentralized sequencer, off-chain data availability, and one block finality. What does all that mean? Rock-solid security, a trustless bridge to Ethereum, and more real world use cases for Ethereum without compromise. And real world adoption is happening. Active addresses on Celo have grown over 500% in the last six months. With the Celo Layer 2, gas fees will stay low and you can even pay for gas using ERC20 tokens. But Celo is a community governed protocol. This means that Celo needs you to weigh in and make your voice heard. Join the conversation in the Celo forum. Follow at Celo org on Twitter and visit Celo.org to shape the future of Ethereum. Mm -hmm. George Harris, could you just illuminate much better than I could the uh, technical benefits of staying inside of the ecosystem, just all of the uh, the developer ecosystem tailwinds that one would get by joining one of these uh, broader ecosystems versus uh, swimming alone, for example? Like, what are the benefits? Can you help us uh, shed some light on that? Well, there's the benefits from the infra operator side, the, you know, the chain builder, and then there's the end user using a chain that's a part of that. Um, I would think that from the infra operator side, you basically get a managed service of something that you would otherwise you yourself need to do, that is security upgrades, governance, patching, having on-call support, all of these things. I think these matter a lot more than uh, people think. Um, from the user side, by being part of a such system, you would get the free composability to your to your users. Um, and you also get, of course, that, um, you know, one one RPC. Uh, you don't need to talk to every single thing separately. So in general, you get, uh, in one word, maybe what you get is that you get uh, homogeneity. I see you writing in the doc, David, uh, you're writing the trust as a differentiator. I think you get the trust anyway, if each system is done properly. Um, mm. I think it's honestly, you know, right now it's uh, we're in a bit of an embarrassing state where, no, you don't get that much uh, trustlessness. Um, in the end state, whether you are in a shared or not system, if that system is like running off of a specific version of a broader standard, I think it doesn't matter if it's part of a super chain or if it's not. Ultimately, you know, just to illustrate the point with an example, if the Blast L2 is like deployed correctly uh, with appropriate fault proofs um, and you're in it, you have same you know, protocol security as any other mm. L2 or L2 ecosystem if it's deployed with the appropriate uh, parameters. Do you get the same composability? No, because uh, maybe you're deployed on a separate ecosystem if you're at that L2. If you're in the ecosystem, then you get the composability. So on the trust component, I feel like you're you're good anyway. So even at a more pedestrian level, I think like the compatibility is important for tooling. I know George just brought it up, but just to make it explicit, right. Things like block explorers, things like Tenderly, things like Dune, all of this like tooling, um, you know, they need to run RBCs, they need to run against RBCs, their, you know, software works against certain versions. Um, and so like the like if you think that every single one of these tools has like a cracked infra team and is gonna be able to keep up with all the different customizations, I think you have a very overrated sense of like how many engineers there are in the industry. Um, mm -hmm. And I think ultimately, again, you just want to be able to ride this wave where you have the same stuff you can plug and play just by switching out an RPC endpoint versus something massively custom that then you're fighting against the tide. George, I just want to double check on that, that trust element, make sure that we're talking about the same things. Uh, 
the way that I kind of understand this is that when there's going to be 10,000 different chains, the overhead for users to understand the safety and security of the chain that they're on or they're interested in using is going to be too much. And I don't really think about this when I go to any website. That's fair. But sometimes there's one of these websites that I go to and my browser is like, hey, this website you might want to think twice about. And I would have no idea how to identify that if the browser didn't tell me this. And so this is like one of the benefits of having a shared uh, uh, state uh, of whichever the chain is built on. So like the OP stack. And so you could imagine that, that little shield of security in your browser when you go to an HTTPS website, you might have something similar. So it's like you are on a verified OP stack chain with a verified client. That's kind of what I mean Th by that's a by great Great point. That, that, that's, a, that, that's a great point. I had not appreciated that uh, earlier when I was talking. Yes, uh, spot on. Uh, every shield that we have on our browsers, uh, when every browser will bundle a wallet and whatnot, every shield that we have in the browser will for sure be um, extra shielded, let's say, when it uh, mm -hmm. captures an OP stack chain or a, you know, an orbit chain or whatever else. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know that the user will know whether it is part of a specific flavor. Um, right. But the user will need a certain lockbox to to indicate it. Beautiful, beautiful. I want to pivot to uh, the modular conversation. Uh, Andrew, right before we started this uh, podcast, I actually noticed that uh, Conduit put out this uh, tweet about uh, Lyra, which is one of the Conduit OP stack chains, uh, pivoting its data availability from what I believe was the Ethereum layer one to Celestia. Um, Give us your perspective as to the evolution of, of this conversation where we have Ethereum layer twos but that are potentially consuming Celestia for, for data availability. Where do you think this goes in 2024? Yeah, I think what this really enables is bringing roll-up costs down significantly um, to a point that really enables like new apps, uh, right? And so I think like um, roll-ups kind of quite expensive, particularly if you look at December, right? Midnight gas prices were like spiking. There was a ton of activity. And... Even if you have your own rollup, you're still not fully insulated from all the activity that actually happens there, right? Because as mainnet gas, gas prices increase like 5x, 10x, 100x, whatever it is, suddenly like your app, which, you know, maybe had sub cent fees, sub 10 cent fees, you're paying like a dollar per transaction. And that meaningfully changes the business model and the economic model um, for a lot of these rollups where, you know, frankly, a lot of them are either one, like the point of the chain is that fees are low. To enable new types of behavior like on Zora network like collecting and minting is very cheap or frankly like a lot of these applications are paying gas fees for their users and like you know they're just running up this huge bill um, and that's ultimately where all da layers are really going to come into play is like separating that data cost from the activity that's happening on ethereum mainnet while you know there is an additional kind of like security assumption around like that data being available and being able to relay to ethereum and like eventual integration with fraud proofs but today, frankly, the just economic reasons of having 10, 100x, 1,000x cheaper fees um, or really just bottom line for the rollup are just like too insane to ignore and are really enabling any team to launch a rollup today. Interesting. One of the uh, perspectives for app chain bears will say that app chains probably won't have enough users or volume, uh, transaction volumes in order to justify themselves because rollups have costs. Uh, using Celestia uh, or, you know, just cheaper data availability providers uh, for cheaper DA than, than Ethereum helps with this thesis where, well, you know, if we have cheaper data availability, it's the main cost for rollups. So, so therefore, there are going to be more app-specific rollups that can economically justify themselves. What's your perspective on this? Like, how far will we be able to go down the long tail of app uh, specific rollups being able to economically justify themselves and is and so there's like two variables here there's just more users making more transactions and so we can justify more that way and then there's also cost going down on the infrastructure and data availability sides uh, just give us a, a a peek forward on your perspective with this yeah i mean i think like ultimately with alt da as you said it's like 95 or more percent of kind of the cost mm -hmm. of a rollup um and alt da basically makes that free um, I think mm -hmm. enables like a lot more use cases and enables startups to just experiment. Um, and like, not all of these are going to stay around forever. Like startups, right? 90% are like some wild statistic, like 90% of them fail. I think you may see something similar uh, along the kind of like long tail rollups, but the fact that, um, you know, if you go to AWS, you spin up an EC2 instance, it costs you like 20 bucks a month. Like ultimately, if you can get the price down to a point where it's kind of risk-free to start and just kind of see where it goes, 
I think that's ultimately the world that Conduit wants to live in and what we want to enable. And ultimately, I think we'll see a lot more innovation that way. And, you know, I, I'd say we're still kind of not quite there yet. I think Alt-DA gets us a lot closer to that reality. Can you, Andrew, give us some perspective of uh, the lowering costs of being a roll-up over time? Since when you started Conduit and there was a lot of juice left to squeeze, you've squeezed some juice and now roll-ups are easier and cheaper to deploy. There's more juice left to squeeze, I'm sure. Give us a, a sense of like where things started, uh, where things have been and where they are recently, and then where they are going in terms of just like the trend of uh, lowering costs of roll-ups. Yeah, for sure. So I think like uh, maybe a year ago when the company was starting, it was, you know, there's no documentation, you know, it's uh, the code base is changing in very significant ways. Um, and like not all the software was production ready. Um, and so kind of starting in that environment was very challenging. But I think it's allowed us to get expertise in the stacks that we're using and really build uh, production grade kind of production ready deployments. Um, and ultimately, like, I think that's kind of the most important thing is um, understanding the pain points, understanding the vulnerabilities of these stacks, like where things might go wrong, and then allowing us internally to build like solutions for that. I think one good example of that is something that we built internally called Conduit Elector, um, which allows for high availability sequencing of, you know, OP stack chains, as well as like Arbitrum Orbit chains. And, um, you know, prior to this, in order to upgrade a chain, you'd have to have like downtime, right? You'd have to bring down the sequencer, upgrade the code, let it sync up again, bring it back up. And, you know, downtime means that people can't use the chain, you're losing money, you're, you're losing revenue. Um, Conduit Elector actually allows you to roll out those upgrades with zero downtime, which means that users don't even notice that an upgrade happened. Um, that's also important for things like if a hardware failure happens or something like that, we automatically fail over. Versus, you know, um, I think for a lot of OP stack chains out there today, it's a manual failover, which again means that when it goes down, somebody needs to get paged, they need to wake up, they need to figure out what the <laughs> issue is, and then they need to like actually fail it over. Um, and so cutting our teeth on kind of those early problems allowed us to build like a best in class solution that, you know, one, much better for kind of the reliability of the chain, but also frankly, giving us a lot of insight into the future of things like shared sequencing. Mm hmm. Yeah, one of the interesting things I always just think about Conduit and these other like rollers as a service providers is like I alluded to earlier, this just like an epicenter of many chains. Like all the chains are like proximate to each other inside of a RAS. Uh, could you just uh, just share with us what what's the RAS business model? The, the the archetypal archetypal like business model for a RAS. Like how does a RAS make money? And then what can a RAS do for the webbings between the chains? Yeah, for sure. So I guess in terms of business model, it's typically two components to that. There are the infrastructure and like hosting fees, which are, you know, you're, you're running a bunch of stuff um, kind of mm -hmm. uh, for the chain. This, you're running the sequencers, you're running any additional components to sync with layer one. Um, you're running the, you know, RBC. Hopefully it's auto scaling um, versus kind of like a fixed set of nodes. That's actually like kind of a, you know, non-trivial thing to solve. Um, and then you have your metrics, you have your alerting, so you have all the stuff to make sure that it's, you know, production ready and, and going to be ready for mainnet. Um, and is this all just so like SaaS stuff? This is just SaaS model? So that's kind of just like a SaaS model, right? And like, I think over right. time, costs will be brought down. And like, I think crypto software hasn't been engineered in a way that makes it easy to do multi-tenancy, for example. So like, if you look at um, a lot of traditional Web2 companies, whether it's like Planet Scale or like you, you pick any SaaS, um, they've kind of built multi-tenancy into the model, which means that you get to share, you know, a bunch of customers across like one kind of hardware stack. Um, today, everything is pretty um, distinct. And what that means is like everybody gets their own dedicated capacity. And so like that's great for like stability and uptime. It does mean that for kind of the longer tail, it's just like a bit more expensive to run. And over time, like internally, we're working on solutions here that will, again, bring the price down. Um, and allow you to scale with your volume. Um, and so today the mm -hmm. RPC is somewhat that, but like you can imagine for sequencing, right? Um, and the main kind of bottleneck being, um, you know, processing these transactions and kind of access to state. Um, you can elastically kind of scale that up to absorb like a burst of transactions and then like scale that down. And so just getting the kind of price to performance ratio automatically correct over time is definitely something that um, we're keen on. Um, the other aspect of the business model is sequencer fees. So as you know, Mm. Um, sequencers sell L2 gas um, 
and buy L1 gas, right? Uh, and so that diff is the sequencer kind of like net revenue. Um, and ultimately, like most of that goes to the customer. It's their right, right? It's kind of like the, the revenue model. And then typically RAS providers take a percentage of this um, and then roll up frameworks, for example, Optimism and uh, Arbitrum or kind of, uh, you know, name your roll up here, um, may also take a kind of a percentage of that as well. A percentage of that as well. And is that the fee, the 15% Optimism fee that base uh, pays to the Optimism Collective? Is that what you're talking about? That's right. So for the super chain, it's 15%. Um, and then right. I believe for Arbitrum, depending on the license, I think it's around 10%. Okay. Okay. Understood. These, uh, okay, these so models the... are obviously kind of evolving over time. Sure. Certainly. Yeah. Well, crypto is evolving over, all over time, isn't it? Um, uh, so RAS, the RAS business model is just uh, volume. It's just volume, right? It's just total transactions. That's really where it comes from. Yeah. Mix of transactions. I mean, like if you look at it really depends on the network. For example, for Zora Network, we're probably around 50-50 in terms of hosting fees and like sequencer revenue. Um, mm. But also they have one of the largest, uh, because they have so many integrations, um, we actually just have a ton of load on the RBC endpoint that we don't monetize today. And so in the future, you can imagine, again, us like bringing costs down like significantly um, and then being able to charge more granularly kind of with the RBC. Okay, so imagine that there's um, a chain that's just massive, tons of volume. It's a single chain that's doing a ton of volume. Your share of that vo of the revenue of that it probably decreases as a percentage, but it increases in nominal terms, right? And so maybe some of these um, smaller, less used, less popular chains, you guys are taking like maybe let's get more of a 50-50 split. But then as these chains get larger, your percentage of your revenue comes down on a per chain basis, but the total like you. US dollar revenue goes up. Is that right? I think that's one way that, that it could work. I think ultimately we're still very early in like these models um, and mm -hmm. whether or not sequencer revenue is the primary revenue driver for the customer. Um, one example is like, um, I, I keep bringing them up, but Zora Network, right? They have a $1 mint fee. Um, and mm -hmm. so if you just look at the mint fee and how many mints they have, that's the primary revenue driver. And so sequencer fees are kind of less important for that. Um, right. And so ultimately, it's going to be case by case based on the customer. Um, and, you know, what we want to do is just kind of align incentives and make sure that, you know, we're getting value when we're providing value for the customer. Case by case based on the customer, the customer being the chain. Uh, that. So that sounds hard to scale. <laughs> if we're going to have millions and millions of rollups, which is what we all kind of want, at least thousands, starting with thousands, how do you scale out a business model in which each the economics of each chain is, has to be negotiated? Definitely. So that's where I think like today our ethos is like do things that don't scale. And in the future, <laughs> we'll have to figure out a way to kind of like uh, kind of like wrap back to this and, and figure out something a bit more scalable. I think like mm -hmm. our focus today is on just serving as many chains as possible and getting our infra kind of out there. Um, and so we're less concerned today about like particular splits or, or kind of whatever. And mm -hmm. we're more interested in kind of growing the market because I think a year ago people didn't know it existed. And now it's taking off in an exciting way. And we just want to 10x or 100x that kind of over the next year. And David, w w one way that I've been thinking at least about Conduit from the very beginning is that's almost like the Switzerland of infrastructure. You just deploy things. It's there for you. Um, we will co-locate services happily. Um, we will offer every service that is not a commodity like for basically cost price because we want to go where the value is and to ultimately, as Andrew said, grow the pie. Whereas right now, if you look at the infra market, it's a bit embarrassing how much people charge for services that are embarrassingly, you know, cheap to run or, you know, not that sophisticated to operate. So with Conduit, we hope to kind of commoditize all of these areas and to go to where the actual value is. What was what did you call it, Georgios? The Switzer Switzerland? I didn't catch that. Oh yeah, the Switzerland of infrastructure. Switzerland, Switzerland. Ah, okay. Okay. So yeah, 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 yeah. My, my English. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, interesting, interesting. Um, Andrew, one more question about like kind of the economics of, of a RAS. I've always understood that RASs are kind of in a tug of war with the roll-up frameworks. Uh, and so the roll-up frameworks, the OP stacks, the Arbitrum orbits, they want they want their fees. Um, RASs want their fees. Uh, and there's kind of like a thumb of war of, of who gets the fees. Uh, how do you think about this relationship with the, with the, the relationship between RASs and uh, roll-up frameworks? 
I think like maybe in the long run, like if you um, really analyze it, I think you're right. There probably is some sort of like uh, competitive aspect there in the future. I think like given the state of the market today, it's so early, it's so small and there's so much room to grow that I just don't think it really comes up. And ultimately the way that I think about it is like, we want to work very closely with all the different role frameworks and enable the distribution of their software. Um, and I think it's a very different skill doing that than core protocol development of the actual role. And so I think there's a ton of um, kind of synergies and, and complementary skills here. And we're very excited to kind of package up what we've done with the OP stack and the Orbit stack and bring that to new frameworks and, and new ecosystems. And I think ultimately, again, our attitude today is, you know, let's grow the pie together versus like fight over the small scraps that exist today. Beautiful. George, I want to turn the conversation to L2 security. You brought up um, multi-client fraud proofs earlier, which um, I believe are the same things as multi-provers, but provers are in the ZK sense. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I, I want to start there. Uh, there's a lot of like focus on uh, rollups being centralized because they don't have shared sequencing, but I actually don't think that that's right. Um, one of the benefits I've always thought is like rollups actually get to have centralized computation because of fraud proofs, because of uh, ZK proofs. Um, maybe you can unpack that a little bit more and, and explain it better than, than I can, and then we'll get into the conversation of why multi-provers and multi-client fraud proofs are important. But can you just uh, talk about the role of uh, shared sequencing with the, when it comes to decentralization and how important is that? Of course. So a rollup is an extension of the mainnet block. Um, and a sequencer is just a privileged party that's able to, we trust them for some things to order and to give us some batching benefits before we extend that mainnet block. Now, right now we only have one sequencer. Um, and that one sequencer, maybe they can misbehave. They can misbehave by doing anything they want. They could uh, introduce an invalid state transition. They could omit a transaction. They could do a lot of things. Um, to combat that, their layer two system design basically introduces a proof or a game or whatever you want to call it that the sequencer needs to follow in order to make sure that even though it's one person, um, that person cannot screw us, which means that they cannot take away funds from us and they cannot censor us. And for that, there is two mechanisms that rollups employ. One is the fault proof and the validity proof, which ensures that the sequencer cannot steal funds from us, because if they do, somebody in the optimistic case will come in and challenge them, and that will abort the invalid state transition. Or in the validity proof world where the sequencer is responsible for also posting some cryptographic information that says, hey, what I did is actually correct. Um, now for the censorship use case, not for the you know soundness of my funds, but for the censorship use case, every rollup protocol also comes in with a force inclusion uh, function, which means that if the sequencer dies, stops responding, you know, goes on vacation, whatever, um, the user can go to the layer one smart contract and uh, their wallet ideally in the future again this is something that's also in an embarrassing state today um, the wallet should basically choose hey sequencer is down instead of sending the transaction the sequencer actually send it to the l1 and that will trigger um, that will keep things going um, now we're not in this world um, so because we're not in this world um, we have multisigs on all uh, sequencer upgrades and we know who the sequencer is. So until we have the ability to have anyone to be able to submit a fault proof and until we have the ability for anyone to spin up a sequencer to continue the chain if the previous sequencer dies, um, we're going to stay in with multisigs um, and it's going to remain centralized. Now how do we get to this world where anyone can propose uh, fault proofs or anyone can be a sequencer? That is the word of multi-provers or of uh, whatever, whatever you want to call it, a multi-sig of fault proofs or a multi-sig of validity proofs. And the idea is um, that because the fault proofs and the validity proofs are novel technologies, instead of having one of them um, decide the outcome of a dispute or of a certain operation, why not have, let's say, two or three or more? Um, why don't we have a quorum, let's say a two of three quorum? Um, many configurations will exist, um, but for example, in the optimism context, 
we're going to have one fault proof that runs on MIPS uh, built on Geth. We will also have another fault proof that again runs on MIPS but built on Reth. And we'll have a third proof that is built on risk zero and is actually validity proof. Um, and we will only allow a withdrawal to go through if two of three of them agree on the outcome. Now, why would we do that? Because it gives us more redundancy. And with more redundancy, we gain more confidence in the security, in the security of the system in aggregate. And by doing that, we can finally reach the so-called stage two decentralization in rollups, which will let us remove the training wheels. I think mm -hmm. this will happen in 2024. Oh, wow. This this year, this has been like one of the big things that's been holding uh, layer two rollups back in terms of just their full decentralization and, and trustlessness. Right. And the way that I kind of think about this is like it's just the multi client design for Ethereum that has protected Ethereum so many times now doing the same things for layer twos, but it yes. was inside of the fraud proof context. And so if there's yes. one bug in one fraud proof or one bug in an optimism client, all of a sudden that's catastrophic. But if we have multiple client fraud proofs, then all of a sudden we have that redundancy, 99% exactly. uptime and, and full decentralization. Exactly. I've always thought that this is like the most complicated thing about building decentralization into layer twos. You said that you think that we're getting these in as like, you know, available for the main uh, roll up standards in 2024. What makes you so confident that we're getting them this year? Uh, that would be my prediction, in particular because we have one MIPS fault proof, fault proof already on OPGeth that Optimism has developed and has on Testnet, and uh, we have a work, like a, there is a work in progress on the Reth side to incorporate these as part of the OP Reth project. So you know, one might ask, mm -hmm. why are we doing the OP Reth project? You know, not just because we want the high performance, but because we thought that it would heavily accelerate the stage two decentralization for rollups. Um, I think this is also the first time that we talk about this in public, but yeah, in general, we're like very excited about using the REST, let's say SDK, REST, REST software stack as a general accelerant for the entire EVM ecosystem, whether it is performance, whether it is indexers, RPCs, or the decentralization of layer two. Mm -hmm. And maybe just to tie this back to an earlier conversation, if you are an OP stack chain, and these uh, multi-client fraud proofs uh, get delivered, then everyone gets to upgrade all at once because we're all on the same same standard. If you're an OP stack chain, is why it's one of the benefits of being with the herd. You're being, being aggregated, with the, with yeah, them. exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, cool. Okay, so uh, that's the the big thing about uh, layer two security. What other uh, conversations are relevant? Would you say, Georgios, in the layer two security conversation, or is that kind of just like the big one? Um, I think the modification story will be interesting. Andrew uh, touched on it a bit earlier. Um, you know, when you give people the ability to experiment, they will do crazy things, both in the good and in the bad sense. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that people will experiment with like things that are, you know, in general, like interesting ideas, for example, uh, native yield rebasing coin or fee sharing or whatever. Uh, but who knows if people will be able to implement these soundly. You know, um, will there be a library of plugins, let's say, that people are excited to interact with? And these are the whitelisted ones or the, you know, the conduit app store offered ones. I, I honestly do not know. People will probably will probably go through a big pirate phase where people will change the gas token to pay. People will change the runtime. You know, there will be L2s that are not EVM L2s. We're already seeing that with uh, ellipses, we're seeing that with Eclipse, we're gonna see it with like the move layer twos, we're gonna see it with like every runtime that exists. Um, there will be layer a twos runtime. that is deploy- A runtime, is that just another word for a virtual uh, machine? Yes, 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 sorry. So the okay. runtime and the virtual machine are equivalently used here. Uh, so it could be EVM, SVM, move VM, uh, you know, brain fog for all I know, like whatever you want, uh, like it doesn't matter. Um, so there's many, many choices to experiment on the, on the runtime. On the transaction format, people will come up with novel account abstraction techniques. People will come up with privacy systems, all, all, all sorts of things. I think, uh, we're entering an era, David, where node, like nodes have been thought to be like a hard thing to ship or to work on or whatever. 
you know, because they require people to learn about databases, about peer-to-peer, -peer, about each runtime. They require a lot, a lot of knowledge. I think we're entering an era where the node modifications become so, so, so easy that it will open up an era of experimentation in blockchain that we didn't see before, um, which is very exciting for everyone working on infrastructure. I think the state of layer two development and progress over the last few years has really been about minimizing the diff between Ethereum and layer twos. The fight for Ethereum compatibility evolved into the fight for Ethereum equivalence. Uh, and as a result, we have a lot of very popular layer twos that are just, you know, carbon copies of Ethereum, but faster. Uh, and I think maybe, George, that's what you're saying is that not only have we kind of neglected non-Ethereum versions of rollups that can settle on Ethereum, but also the technical difficulties of building these systems has also been easier than ever. Is that is that kind of the, the groundwork that you're laying? I, in general, my prediction would be that 2024 is the year where performance, you know, we end the year basically and performance stops being a differentiator. Everybody will have figured mm -hmm. out high performance. Um, we will be in a world where parallel EVMs that we've seen discussed a lot, new databases, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. Finally, now that we've learned how to modify nodes, everybody will like figure out in some way. You know, not everybody will, will be in production. Few will be in production, the best teams only. But over the years, what's happening is that the best technology uh, that was considered a moat is finally starting to be, for lack of a better word, democratized and accessed uh, by everyone. And when these performance things stop being like the differentiators that people go for, we're entering the next area of uh, innovation, which is, you know, the UX, the account abstractions, the signing algorithms. Uh, the gas sponsorships, everything that has been kind of like in toy mode uh, in the last year, which it's grown a lot, you know, but it's still small uh, account abstraction and the like compared to, let's say, where MetaMask is uh, in terms of adoption. All of these, um, every chain will start to experiment so much with the feature they're able to offer that somebody will hit gold on some unique feature mm -hmm. that enables some unique app. So that's why the layer two vision is also very exciting, David, because it is what allows you to start deploying chains on Conduit or anywhere else. These chains that will be modified uh, ad nauseum uh, and we'll see a lot of nonsense in the process, a lot, a lot of nonsense we will see in the process, but somebody will hit gold and that somebody will make something very valuable. Mm. Andrew, it sounds like uh, Georgios is calling for like a golden age of layer two experimentation, uh, which I think uh, if I were in your shoes, I'd be maybe a little bit intimidated because I think Conduit is all about like, how can we replicate the same stuff over and over and over again? But when there's a bunch of new stuff, all of a sudden there's new, new things to, to replicate. So w if there's going to be like a, a bunch of new uh, uh, pieces of software that you have to support. Uh, how do you think about this? If this is the what we're going into in 2024, and all of a sudden it's not just the, the OP stack and Arbitrum orbits, but it's like the third thing and the fourth thing and the fifth thing, and then the sixth thing just around the corner. How do you think about this? Yeah, for sure. I think that's a, a great question. I think ultimately it depends on the form factor of the customization. Um, and it is something that we think about here at Condor, right? It's like, what roll-up stacks do we support? Today we support Orbit and Optimism. What is the next one? Um, and then in terms of customization, like how does that actually make its way into the stack? For example, if it's just an execution client change on the OP stack or like the Arbitrum Orbit side, that is actually like pretty workable and like we support that today. And you can actually have minimal modifications to our infrastructure, everything just kind of works. And then we just slot in your custom execution client. I think the more custom you go in terms of the entirety of the stack, um, that is essentially like writing a new rollup framework, right? So like. If you look at Starkware, if you look at any of these other things, like I guess the most similar thing would be like a Cosmos app chain, right? Where you take this like base SDK, but then you like customize a bunch of stuff. I think ultimately time will tell like how important that model is and whether or not you need to reinvent the wheel or you just want to reuse kind of the existing pieces of the stack and just customize what's important to you. Um, and so, you know, jury's still out. I think we want to support everything that we can. Um, and ultimately, it's kind of our challenge to figure out the kind of best way to make that scalable. Mm -hmm. 
Andrew, Georgius, I've, I've learned a ton in this episode. I'm going to have to go back and, and re-listen to this to make sure I got everything. Uh, we're entering what seems to be a bull market. Bull markets get very, very busy. Uh, they can also be very distracting. Uh, but Andrew, when we are done with this podcast episode and you go back to work at Conduit, what are you going to focus on? What is the, the nearest uh, term thing that you are focusing on right now? Yeah, I mean, I'd say that uh, given the gas fee uh, kind of spiking in December and, you know, Celeste, uh, you know, becoming production ready and conduit supporting it, our, our biggest task is really uh, migrating a bunch of chains to Celeste DA. Um, I think our next goal after that is making, you know, blockchains and, and rollups as accessible as like using AWS. And so I think today, you know, we offer a self-serve kind of testnet API. I think our question is like, you know, what happens when we make that accessible and permissionless for anybody to deploy to mainnet and like what kind of Cambrian explosion does that enable? Georgia, same question to you. So at the top level, I'm excited to continue working with great people like Andrew and others who are working to push on the limits of what people think is hard and making it really, really easy. Um, personally, David has just wrote a goal doc called what is 10x ref in 2024. Um, so I hope to join our team into pushing the limits of performance and commoditize the 10K TPS uh, in 2024. I'm excited for the Wrath SDK to be used to build new rollups, to build new experiments and to, in the end, push forward the layer two industry. And I'm also finally excited about the Wrath core, let's say roadmap in 2024, the upcoming Cancun 4844, release and finally by end of march to be 1.0 production ready ready to support ethereum layer one um audited by sigma prime you know going going ham in the year and pushing pushing the frontier really hard going ham in the year pushing the frontier i love that georgios why does the world need reth what what is reth and why does the world need it reth is a rust is an Ethereum node uh, compared to Geth, Aragon, Nethermind. Um, it is written in Rust and it's a modular and blazing fast node that is also contributor friendly. What this means is that while it achieves best in class performance on most benchmarks that matter, it is also aimed at developers. It has a developer community and is built to be used first and foremost as a library. And we see Reth as a almost like as a test bed for building EVM native infrastructure. And we want to give to the world access to these high quality tools that we've been using over the years with the node as the first demonstration of how good these tools can be. And hopefully with other infrastructure built on top of it, like OP Ref, like the OP Fault Proof, like a bunch of infrastructure that Conduit will be running in the future and other portfolio companies. Um, we really want to push the frontier of what is hard that should be really easy on infrastructure. And we're going to commoditize with it everything that we think is currently hard or perceived as hard. Well, thank you, Georgios, for doing Hero's work, uh, speeding up Ethereum and helping with, with its decentralization, both on the layer one and on the layer two, uh, is what I would call very noble work. So thank you for, uh, both for coming on Bankless and uh, sharing us with your perspectives and what you guys are building. Uh, it's making me very optimistic for the world of layer twos in, in 2024. Big gear ahead, David. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Bankless Nation, you know the deal. Crypto is risky. Layer twos are risky. Hopefully, they're becoming less risky. That's the plan. At least you can lose what you put in. But we're headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we are glad you're with us on the Bankless journey. Thanks a lot.